I'd like to introduce um, Sam Nazar. He is a senior software engineer with uh, NIS Technologies. Um, <clears throat> I've known Sam for many, many years, and um, uh, he usually presents for us usually about once a year or so. Uh, and this month, he'll be speaking on overview of Azure Cognitive Services. So I'll go ahead and stop my share and Sam, take it away. All right, thank you, Greg. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, presenting to this group. Um, wanted to start by just discussing a little bit about myself. I've been a software developer since 1995. I'm a senior software engineer for NIS Technologies, as uh, Craig had mentioned. And I've been certified with several certifications from Microsoft over the years. And one of my favorite things to do is to run the Cleveland c -sharp VB.NET user group. Uh, in addition, I also run the .NET study group. And I've authored several articles for Visual Studio Magazine, as well as the, the blogs for Twilio. And some of tonight's content is also available on the Twilio blog, and I can share the link with you later. I've also been a five-time Microsoft MVP. Uh, just like to share some overhead information. Um, please keep in mind that participation is always encouraged. Jump in with questions or comments at any point in time. I kindly ask you to mute your microphones when not speaking, just to avoid any background noise. And we're gonna to try to keep it as casual, uh, but organized, meaning feel free to jump in with questions at any point in time. But at the same time, I have a certain set of slides and demos uh, that I'd like to go through to help give you a better overview of Azure. Uh, also wanted to give a shout out to the uh, c -sharp VB .NET user group. Uh, we meet every month. Meetings are free of charge and open to the public. And we cover all topics related to .NET. And you can find meeting information on meetup.com. And the purpose of this slide is not to pull you away from the Akron AITP group, but rather I like to promote cross-pollination, if you will. So uh, not only do I speak at other groups, I attend them, and I encourage others to do so. Uh, and I, the one gentleman that just recently joined, um, if you found one meeting fruitful, I guarantee you the more meetings you attend, the more benefit you're going to get from it. So highly encourage you to cross-pollinate. So without further ado, let's get into Azure Cognitive Services. And what Cognitive Services are about is that they provide services that provide human interpretation, meaning uh, I can take natural spoken English as I'm speaking to you now, and then I can get the, the user's intention out of it. Or I can submit a picture and it can tell me what is in that picture, whether it's a, a human being who's smiling, whether it's an object that I have determined to, to look at, or whether it's a phrase that I want to dissect and see, is there anything inappropriate within that phrase before I post it on my website, like a comment, for example, or a message. So basically, like I said, it provides human interpretation. Um, also, it's used for building intelligent applications. So typically, whenever we're building an app, we always strive to make it as user-friendly as possible, something intuitive. But now I think with cognitive services, we can take it to the next level where it's we can make the app similar to interacting with another human being in the way that it can see things and the way that it can listen and hear things from the user. So it's taking it a, a notch above. And the best thing is there is no direct AI or data science skills required. So I don't need to be a data scientist. I don't need to know machine learning. It's essentially an API call that I'm making once I train my model, and then I'm off and running. And the models are built using external portals that are linked to the Azure account. So first and foremost, I need to set up an Azure account. And then depending on which service I'm using, I will need to use an external site that will help me build that model. So for example, if I am using the custom vision service, then I will set up an account in Azure, and then I will go over to customvision.ai set up my model, train it, and then be able to use it in my application. So it's a combination of external portals as well as the Azure account that uh, needs to be linked to that portal. And access to the, the, the services can be done either through a web API call, a REST API, or through an SDK that I can download and essentially specify certain parameters, and it will make the REST API call for me on the back end. So either method would work, but essentially we're going up against the cloud, uh, specifically Azure, and then retrieving the, uh, the services from there. And there's a couple comments in the chat. Okay, 
no questions, but feel free to enter in questions in the chat or jump in verbally if you like. So looking at the cognitive services, essentially from a 30,000 foot perspective, it's broken down into several categories, vision, decision-making, where it can look at certain content and decipher whether it's appropriate or not appropriate, whether it contains uh, personal identifiable information. Um, there's also the language service that will help interpret natural spoken language into what the user's intention is. Meaning if I wanted to buy a car, for example, when I walk into a dealership, I can say, sell me a car. I want to buy a car. Do you have a red Mustang? All three phrases essentially suggest that I want to buy a car. That's my intention. And so once I submit that phrase to cognitive services, it will come back and it will tell me that the user's intention is to buy a car. In addition, there's also other subservices such as speech to text, text to speech, and so forth. And then there's the speech services. Um, sorry, I jumped the gun there. Speech services will uh, interpret the text to speech, speech to text, and then also do sentiment analysis. So meaning if I say something like, um, I, uh, I love uh, going to work as much as I love um, uh, getting beat up, for example, hypothetically, okay? Obviously I'm being sarcastic there, but the sentiment is, is that I, it's, it's a negative thing. I don't like going to work, right? Uh, and by the way, side note, I love my job. So it's just an example. So these are the major categories that we're gonna be looking at. There's also a, a fifth category called search, but I highly doubt we're gonna have enough time to get to it tonight. Uh, but essentially from a, a 30,000 foot perspective, you got five different categories. And then within each category, there are multiple subcategories. So let's take the first one with vision service and dive a little bit into it. So within vision service, there's something called custom vision. Uh, what this allows us to do is to be able to do object detection, meaning I can submit a picture to the service and I can say, tell me what objects are in it that I trained it on. So in the demo that I'll show you later, basically I trained it on a oil filter to detect a, an oil filter within the picture. So if I walk into an auto parts store and I don't know that this is this thing that I have is called an oil filter, I can show them a picture and they'll say, oh yeah, it's an oil filter. Likewise, now I can do the same thing with my application. I can just submit a picture of it and it will tell me that that's an oil filter. Within vision services is also another subservice called computer vision. And what this allows me to do is to be able to analyze the content in the images or be able to do OCR or optical character recognition. So in the demo, you'll see that I will submit a business card and then it will come back with all the uh, text portions of that card and it will OCR it for me and convert that image into text. And it will show me where those portions lie, meaning where my name is, where my phone number is, address, etc. Another part of vision service is face identification, where basically I can submit a picture of a human and it will tell me that this person is a male, a female, um, and it will tell me whether they're happy, they're sad, uh, so on and so forth. The video indexer, basically this analyzes video on the fly and it will index the content so that later on I can go back and search for it. And then last but not least is the form recognizer, which is currently in preview. And this will extract document text out of the entire document. Lastly, there's the ink recognizer, which is also in preview. And this does uh, recognition of handwriting samples. So I can submit a handwritten note and then it will recognize the, the handwriting as well as the text within it, and then respond back with the actual text. So the face recognition part, is it able to tell the difference between identical twins? Will it be able to tell the difference between identical twins? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily. Basically, it's going to be, this is an, an example. Um, once I submit the picture into the service, I'm gonna get a JSON result set back. And that's the, the standard for all services within Azure. I make a call, I get everything back in a JSON result set. So for face detection, as you see here in the example, basically it's identifying what's in the picture, but it really can't decipher if it's two separate twins, um, one versus the other, but rather it'll tell me that 
it's a female, approximate age, uh, and then where the face of that person is located. And as you see here, it gives me a rectangular object with the coordinates of where the face of that person is located within the entire image. Yeah. Okay. How's that for a long answer for no? <laughs> Good. Um, so as I mentioned, we get uh, with face detection, we just basically get the where the image lies or whether the face lies within the image. If we look at object detection, um, I apologize that JSON is a little bit small here, but basically an image can have multiple objects within it. So for example, if you look at the picture right now, you see that there is a picture frame behind me, there's some bookshelves, there's a, uh, a filing cabinet, there's also a person speaking, wearing glasses. So there's multiple objects happening inside this image. And so that's what object detection does. If you train it on what objects to look for, it will essentially dissect the entire image and it will come back with uh, the, the rectangle where that image is located or where that object is located in the image. And then it will also give you a confidence score of how confident it is in identifying that image. So if we look over at the JSON on the right side, you'll see that with every rectangle, there's a confidence score uh, for the kitchen appliance, 0.501. And then for the next item, it's identified as a computer keyboard, 0.51. So this model has been trained for those individual objects. So now when I submit that picture, it can identify all those items within it and where they're located and as well as the confidence score. Uh, there's a question in chat. Does the handwriting recognition cover multiple languages? Yes, and uh, we'll cover that in, in just a little bit. And moving on. So demo of custom vision. So let's take a look at an example that I had built and let me move this over here. Okay, so what I have is basically an in my business card, All right, and let me open that up. And we'll jump to the folder in Explorer, and there we go. So let's close this. Okay, so this is a JPEG of my business card. I have my name, uh, the company logo, my title, address and phone number, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to submit this to the service and with this specific service for the uh, custom vision, I don't need to train it, but rather it's gonna be doing OCR on the image that I'm sending it. So to do that, and for the sake of time, I won't be able to cover all the details in setting this up, but essentially in a nutshell, you need to go to Azure and you set up an account and then it will give you a set of keys that you can use and you incorporate those keys within the code and as you see here, I've basically hidden those codes or the subscription keys in my app settings, as well as the URL endpoint. So once I set up the, the resource uh, within Azure, it provides you some certain properties, which include the subscription key, as well as your endpoint that you're gonna be hitting your, uh, with your API call. And so I built an application here where it's basically a console app and I'm submitting the image that I have hard-coded here from my, uh, my hard drive. And so what I'll do is I'll put a breakpoint at the very beginning and we'll walk through the entire uh, application. So we'll click run and we'll wait patiently as it compiles and builds. Oh, uh, seems like everything's running slower in the uh, evening, huh? Indeed. Just when the caffeine wears out, everything just slows down. That's right. Depends on how busy those Azure servers are, right? Well, not only that, unfortunately, because I got several things to demo, so I have multiple instances of Visual Studio open. And so that's taken its toll as well. Sure. 
So I apologize, folks. We should be underway in just a second. Yeah, I mean, you know, Sam, maybe just a, a side comment. Um, I mean, I would think that, I mean, uh, OCR has been around for a long time. I mean, in, in various, or, I mean, f- from other companies too. I mean, not only Microsoft. What is, what is that you're bringing to the table that um, we haven't seen before? So the nice thing about it is because it's an API call, I can have it on a thin client and I no longer need to download a specific software package okay. and work with mm-hmm. it. It is done remotely through the web. So Got it. it's a, a thin client type of environment. Okay, that is, so that now, is cool. So now I got it running. It's a console app. We have a breakpoint where basically I am specifying a JSON file for settings. That's where I'm storing my uh, subscription key and my endpoint. And we'll go ahead and go through that. We're going to load those. And now I'm instantiating the client object for computer vision. And I'm passing it in the URL or URI endpoint, as well as the subscription key. In addition, the next step is going to be loading the image. And then this get text from image will jump into that method. And so what it's gonna be looking at is the overall image and it's gonna return some uh, general information, meaning the the file name, the language that's being used within that file. So there was a question earlier, can it detect different languages? And the answer is yes. Uh, The angle of the text, meaning if the card was at 45 degrees or 90 degrees, it will tell me the angle of the text within that image. And then in addition, all the individual regions uh, that contain text within that image. So because there's multiple regions of text, I have it here inside of a for each loop where it's going to go through all the regions and it's going to spell out all the the bounding boxes, meaning every region is going to have a box around it. And then it's also going to display the text within that region. So if I go ahead and run to completion. So there's my file name. Language is EN for English. The text angle is zero because it's flat. The orientation is facing upwards. And then it starts to give me all the individual regions within that box. So the first region is has the text IT. The next region has the word consulting. And then another region has education and so on. And then more importantly, you get into the more pertinent information, like the company website. And again, that's identified by a line and then individual words within that line. And there's my name and where it's located. My title, email, and so forth. Okay. So I was able to run this through a console application. Basically, I took an image of the card, submitted it to the web service. And then it brought back a result set in JSON that I was able to parse and go through. And it identified each individual region within that image, my name, title, company, and so forth. Okay. Everyone with me? Any questions? This one's pretty straightforward, right? So let's dive a little bit deeper into something a little more complex. And we'll close this one. And close that. So within computer vision, essentially we have the OCR result that's returned in uh, with a language code. It also gives me the text angle in degrees of the detected text. And then the orientation of the image, whether it's up, down, left or right. And then all the individual regions. So the OCR result object contains all those objects within it. So this OCR result is the parent object. The child objects are the OCR region. And this shows the the bounding boxes and then the lines. So if you notice that there was always a set of four numbers and those contain the X coordinate and Y coordinate of the left of the top edge, as well as the width and the height. And then the lines contained within that uh, portion of the bounding box. Next one I wanted to get into is computer vision. 
And then with computer vision, this one's a little bit more interesting in the sense that this is a model that now I have to train. So if we look over on the portal, So as I mentioned earlier, everything starts with Azure, where I set up my resource group, and then I add in the resource, uh, whether it's uh, custom vision or language understanding. In this case, it was custom vision. And so basically I search on it, and then I click create. And then within the create settings, I specify all the different settings re relating to my subscription. Uh, what do I wanna name it? Which region do I want it in? And then more importantly, which resource group that's gonna be tied to, okay? So since I already have one created, I won't go through the details of that or making it. But then, like I mentioned earlier, there's always an external portal that's tied to a service. So for custom vision, that portal is customvision.ai. And so I would log in using the same credentials that I did for my portal. And now I'm gonna set up an object detection uh, demo. And so being a big car buff that I am, I set up a object detection for auto parts, right? So what I did here is you create the project and then you're required to upload several images, a minimum of 15 to be specific. And let me load that up again. So here are multiple images that I loaded in. And within the portal, you can see that once you load the images, it's divided into two categories, those that are tagged versus those that are untagged. So because I have everything tagged, you don't see anything under untagged. And so the key is you want to upload as many images as possible of this object you're trying to detect because you can't guarantee that the user will upload the same picture and the same angle and the same lighting. So you want different scenarios and so here I have just a plain old oil filter head on, as well as with a box in the background. Um, in some cases, it's already mounted on the vehicle. So different angles, different lighting and so forth. And so what you do is you essentially you train it. And so let's take a look at it, this one, for example. So you'll see that when I highlight this region, this is obviously a picture of two oil filters side by side. So obviously it contains two oil filters, right? So this region is an oil filter and this region is also an oil filter. And so once you have it trained, now it's ready to go and I can utilize this in my application. So going into my application, I have an object detection console app. We'll bring that over here. And this is also a console application where I am now submitting the image of an oil filter. I'm still using the same thing, meaning I'm using the a prediction key as well as my base URL where I'm gonna be making that uh, rest point, sorry, the rest endpoint call. And then the result set that I get back is a JSON response. Once I get that JSON response back, then I start to dissect it to see what is that object. And basically, because any image can contain multiple objects, it will give me uh, a rectangle for every object within that image, as well as the confidence rating. What I'm looking for is the highest one that comes within that result set, and then I can correspond accordingly. So for example, let's go ahead and run this app, and I have a breakpoint at the very beginning, so we can step through it. Okay. So in my main method, all I'm doing is I'm specifying the image file, and then I'm making a call to a method called make prediction requests. This is an async call. And the first thing that I'm doing here is I'm instantiating the client object. And now I'm adding in my header, I'm adding in the prediction key, which I obtained from my portal for the custom vision.ai. So essentially that's the model that I trained and that's the one that I want to access. There's my endpoint. And now I am converting that image into a byte array. Once I convert it into a byte array, now I can actually put it within the content type of the header. And now I make my call and I wait asynchronously. Now it responds back with a JSON object. 
I take that JSON object, and now I'm going to deser deserialize it. Let's take a look at the structure that I'm expecting back. So this is the JSON object that I'm getting back. This is the parent object. And then it contains an array of predictions. We have an array because every image contains multiple objects. So naturally with every object in that image, it's going to have a prediction and a confidence setting on it. So within each prediction, there's what's called a bounding box. Just what we have seen with the OCR, that's essentially a rectangular uh, box around the object inside that image. And then within each prediction, it gives me a probability of how confident it is that that is the object that it identified, meaning it's an oil filter versus a spark plug versus what have you. So I go back to my code here, and now I have my deserialized objects. Now I'm looking for the top item that came back and its probability rating. And I'm checking to see how many predictions there are. More importantly, that there's more than one prediction inside that object. And if there is, then I'm gonna look at the, the first one that comes back and the probability. So the tag name that's given to it is as you see here is called oil filter. And then the probability rating is a 60.45% confidence. And then I display that to the user. And there is my console applications telling me the prediction is that it's an oil filter with a 60.45 or 46%. So now I can take it a step further. I can actually have a more human interaction with my user. Here he already submitted a picture. He says, I want this thing, whatever that thing is. I identified it as an oil filter. And now I can search my database. And I can say, we have actually X number of oil filters in stock. And there you see, we have 17 in stock. So now it's more of a human-like interaction. Uh, if a user comes into a store and doesn't know what this item is called, you know, if he comes in and he says, I want this round thing, or instead of having to wait on a person, now I can set up a kiosk where I have my app and all they do is just, hold up the object, take a picture of it, submit it, and then the application responds with what we have in inventory. Pretty cool? So-so? Pretty cool. Excellent, I see some thumbs up, very good. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, maybe just a comment. Um, I guess the, the application that I can see, or that I have seen in real world is, um, like when, when you go to an, I think it's an airport or maybe like a customs station and the U S government, or they, they, they have a camera and they say, okay, hold up your passport, you know, take a, they take a picture of your passport, literally. Um, obviously I don't, don't know. I'm don't know. Are they using Azure for that? Or are they probably using some advanced proprietary technology? Right, Sam? Uh, can neither deny nor confirm that statement. So, uh, <laughs> uh, God only knows what they're using on the back end. But that's not to take away from this, meaning you can utilize this within your application. I, I'm not a, um, uh, a machine learning expert or an AI expert, but thanks to Azure and them democratizing the uh, entire cognitive services, if I know how to make a REST API call, I can access all these cognitive services on the back end. Yeah, I think I was at the grocery store and it probably is doing something like this. It was trying to figure out what kind of fruit, you know, like you hold up a banana and you want to price it out at the, you know, at the self checkout. And it's like, oh yeah, we think that's a banana. So definitely. Yeah, good point. I've been uh, caught at the, the checkout counter multiple times where the, uh, the clerk just simply didn't know, is this, uh, you know, a cucumber or is it squash? Uh, is this beets or is it a pear? Um, you know, so... It definitely helps to have something like that. Good point. Thank you for sharing that, Anna. This is Doug Winger. I have a question. How long does it take for someone to become proficient in the coding structure that you just explained? So uh, this was a relatively simple example because it's a demo. Um, it was a console application, and you can see there isn't really a whole lot to the code. 
Uh, but when you say come become proficient in it, in what aspect are, are you? Well, let me let me. This is going to sound a, maybe a little bit of uh, maybe a little bit off the wall, but I'm I'm an old COBOL programmer. If you can't tell by looking at me, so uh, <laughs> I've written a lot of program code, but it's in a technology that's you know 30 years old, right? That's mm -hmm. still running in some places. So there's so if I have an if I have a background in programming. And I wanted to become a coder in this type of technology and to write these kinds of apps. How, what's, what's the learning curve to do that? Obviously, it's going to vary from one person to the other. But, yeah. you know, first of all, this, this example is written in C Sharp and .NET. Yeah. Uh, so depending on how comfortable you are and how much you've worked with .NET and C Sharp in the past. Yeah. Um, but I mean, by all standards, basically, it's a console application that's making a REST API call. So you would need to know C Sharp. You would need to know how to create a console app and how to make a REST API call. And then on, once you make the call, you're getting a JSON result set back. So I may be throwing a lot of technical terms that you may not have used in the COBOL world. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like I said, it, it's just, it depends on how well you can, uh, you know, take on, uh, how well you can swim in a new tank, if you will. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, Doug, I'll also point out, and I'm not a Visual Studio um, jock like Sam is, but I will point out that in, in many cases, Visual Studio will, will generate a lot of the code for you, depending yeah. on what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating oh. stuff. I love it. Thank you. Not that I created it, but I'm, I'm only a user. Yeah. But it is, uh, it is very interesting. Um, any other questions regarding uh, computer vision? Okay, we're running a little bit tight on time. Uh, so let's get on to the next one. And so the next uh, service that we have in our uh, bag of tricks is decision, decision services. And with this, again, there's multiple services underneath it. So there's the anomaly detector, will, which will identify a problem in a time series of data. Uh, there's the content moderator, which will detect potentially offensive or unwanted content in a message or a, uh, a, uh, a submission. And you can use either the SDK for that, or you could use the web UI. And then last but not least, there's the personalizer, which I presented on, I think, about a year ago, which will identify items that will be pertinent to your own personal experience. Uh, and like the demo that we did last year, you know, if you're shopping for lumber, for example, it may suggest, well, how about some nails to go along with it? Um, so it's helping to personalize your own experience there. Now, let's focus on content moderator since this is relatively new. And what this does is basically it's going to take some text and it will help break it down and identify the key points within it. And so with this, this is accessible through a, a web portal. Um, so there really isn't a model to be trained here, but rather it's a portal where I can try to submit various things, either an image, text, or video. So I'm going to go ahead and submit a text. And something went wrong. Let's reload. Okay, I think I was uh, away from it for too long. All right, let me cheat here for a second. Let me try hit refresh maybe. Yeah, I already did, oh. but okay, there we go. Let's try that again, try text. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to type in a sample text. So I'm submitting the content and it basically it processed the content. It's telling me it's a successfully submitted. Click here to review. I'm gonna click that. And now it's identifying all the individual pieces within the, the sentence that I submitted. So first it's telling me that the language is English. By the way, can everyone see that okay or do I need to enlarge it a little bit? Okay. Okay. 
There we go. That's, that's better. Okay. So first, the text language that's being used is English. Does it have PII or personally uh, personal identifiable information? And in this case, because I specified a sample social security number, it came back as true. Do I have any profanity? Of course not. So it's set to false. And then here's the text where it detected a SSN or social security number, and it's identifying that area of the text. And here it's visually showing it to me. So the whole point of this web portal, let's say I wanna moderate content on a website uh, where customers are putting in their comments. And I need to quickly decipher, is this good or is it bad? And so it will identify key features for me. And this is the web portal access uh, for doing that. Naturally, we wanna be able to do it programmatically. And for that, I would go over into my, um, over into my admin and go over to credentials. And then it will give me an API reference that I can now use in my application to submit that text and then get the results back of whether this content was desirable, whether there's PII in it, whether there's profanity, et cetera. Okay, so it helps to make that decision for me and helps to expedite it. Um, and it, it makes things a little bit easier. So that is the content moderator in a, in a nutshell. Any questions on that? No questions. Either it's straightforward or putting you to sleep, one of the two, I'm not sure <laughs> which yet. But feel free to jump in with questions or comments at any point. Okay. Um, so the next thing is the language services. Uh, that's one of my favorites, Lewis. So, the language services has multiple subservices, if you will. Uh, one of them being Lewis, as I mentioned. The other is Q&A Maker, where this creates a conversational Q&A with the user. So I set up a set of uh, documents that have all my frequently asked questions. Uh, what time do you open tomorrow? How late are you open till? Are you open on 4th of July? Uh, do you accept credit cards? All these different FAQs or frequently asked questions I can create a document of it and then submit it to the Q&A maker. And now my users can interact with that and have a more personal interaction. Meaning I can type in, how late are you open till on Friday? And it will come back with the answer um, for me. In addition, there's text analytics, which will detect sentiments and key phrases, uh, as well as named entities within that, uh, within that phrase. And then lastly, there's the translator, which will detect and translate more than 90 different languages uh, from one language to the other. So taking a closer look at Lewis, Lewis is the short for Language Understanding Intelligence Service, and it's built on interactive machine learning from Microsoft Research, and it uses the language model and training examples to parse natural spoken English. And so, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I go into a dealership and I say, I want to buy a car. Another gentleman may walk in and say, sell me a vehicle. We're both expressing the same intent. We want to buy a car, right? Different verbiage, different structure of sentences, but same intention. So it will be able to decipher what the intention is based on how well it's trained. And once I train it, then I get an API endpoint that I can make a REST call, and then I'm able to retrieve the results. It will take the text string that's passed in as input, and like everything else in uh, Azure Cognitive Services, it will return a JSON result set, and it returns only the parts a developer needs to interact with, meaning it will come back with the intention and the confidence rate, uh, the confidence rating rather, and then it I can also take a look at C, what other possible intentions there are, or I can slim it down just to look at only the top intention. And we'll talk about that in, in the demo. So the way this works as with all other uh, models is essentially I train it and I train it again, and I try to flush out as many scenarios. So you'll see here that we have multiple utterances or sentences that we're passing in and processing, and then Lewis returns a JSON result set. So I will run multiple phrases, see how well it understands it, and, and then I train it 
so that more phrases can be processed and I get a better confidence rate. And that, that way I can publish the application with a level of certainty. So because it's utilizing language, there are language models that it's built on, and I can specify a variety of different languages. And basically it forms the basis of what the user means, meaning the, the intent. So if you look at any spoken sentence, basically it's composed of uh, two certain specific things that we're after. There's the entity or the noun, and then there's the verb within the sentence. The entire sentence is referred to as an utterance, but if I say I want to buy a Mustang, obviously the intent here is to buy, and then the noun is Mustang. So I could also buy an Explorer, I could buy a Jeep or what have you. So it helps to break down the, the noun from the verb, the entity versus the intent. And then we'll produce a result set similar to this. <coughs> Pardon me. Well, will give me the, the query that was submitted to the user, the top scoring intent, and then the confidence score of that top intent, as well as all the other intents and entities within that sentence. So the best way to explain things is to demonstrate it. And so we'll jump into a demo. And let me click and drag this over here. And then in addition, so within my portal, I would specify create a resource. And I want Lewis, so I'm going to specify language understanding. And there's the object that comes back, or the resource rather, and then I would create this. And I would put it under the specific resource group that I have. And in this case, again, it's already pre-created. So I will jump over into my lewis.ai where I have multiple applications created there. And so the intent here is I wanna train it so that it will recognize a, a Mustang in the middle of a sentence. So let's take a look at test app two. And we'll close the splash screen. And so you'll see that I created multiple intents of what a user could possibly want to do. Again, being a car buff, I built this around as a kiosk for a car dealership. So what, could, what are some of the things that someone would want to do when they walk into a car dealership? Buy a car, get their car serviced, uh, could also be a variety of other things, but let's stick with those basic two first. So to buy a car, that is the intent that I created. Once you enter in the intent, now it wants to know how are you going to use it in a sentence. So uh, a sample utterance would be, I would like to purchase a Regal. And I identified Regal here as a car. Another sample utterance is, I want to buy a Mustang. And I identified that as a car. So now I am breaking up my utterance and I'm identifying the certain entities within it. But both of these utterances essentially have the same intent, which is to buy a car, okay? Once I have this set, now I can actually test my model. And I can enter in a sample key phrase. Will you sell me a Mustang? So it comes back and it says, this user wants to buy a car and it's 77.6% confident that that's what the user wants to do, okay? So this is in my portal, in, um, in the Lewis AI portal, because I already set up my uh, Azure for a resource. I'm using this with the keys that were obtained from the Azure portal. And now I can actually publish this application and use it uh, within my app. So let me go ahead and close this. So once I have it published, uh, let's see, there we go. So once I have it published, basically it's going to give me a set of uh, a key as well as an API endpoint to use. And no, not, not that. Ah, there we go. 
So now it's publishing my application. And for accessing the endpoints, these are the keys that I would need to use in my application. And then jumping over into my app, I would utilize those endpoints and let me pause here for a second. There are some questions in chat. Okay, thanks for joining us, Doug. He had to jump off. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> within my application, um, this is uh, a little different in the sense that it's a forms application. And let me show you what it looks like. My goodness, there we go. Okay, so again, around a, a, a car dealership, it's a kiosk application, and it's asking, what can I do for you? And the user will type something in here, click the search button, and then the results will appear in the uh, lower uh, box. So the action starts once the user clicks the search button. We're gonna do uh, a parse on the text that was submitted. So we have a breakpoint there. We'll go ahead and run the application. And so the form comes up with, I want to buy a car already uh, pre-typed in for me. I'm gonna go ahead and click search. We see that the text is what the user entered. I want to buy a car. And then we go into Lewis parse, which is also an async method. So what I'm doing here is I'm instantiating the client. I'm setting my URI. And then I am making the call asynchronously to the client using that URI. And this URI already contains the subscription key and as well as the endpoint uh, that I set up in my, in my portal, in my Lewis AI portal. I make the call and I wait for it to respond. Now, first thing I check is, is the status code successful? So I get a true. Now I'm gonna convert that JSON result set and deserialize it into the response object. What does that response object look like? It's essentially similar to what we had seen before, where we have the parent object that contains multiple children, multiple intents, and multiple entities. And so within each intent, it's going to have the name of the intent and a score, meaning buy a car, service a car, and then how confident it is in setting that, uh, that intent. And then entities are basically the, the, the nouns. So if I specified I want to buy a red Mustang, it would give me a, uh, the adjective uh, for the, the red, as well as the Mustang as the entity, and then where it starts and stops within that sentence. And so what I'm interested in is looking at the highest scoring intent. So going back into my code, I am looking for the first intent that comes back in the array, as well as the first entity that comes back in the array. And so we see that the top intent is by car and the top entity, oh, I'm surprised, came back as empty. Okay. Oh, that's because car is just a generic term. It is not a, a specific um, entity. And so now I, I, I have identified what it is that the user wants. How do I react to it in my application? Now I have a switch statement, which I go through and programmatically I'm checking to see, does the user want to buy a car? Does he want to service a car? What, does he exact, what exactly does he want to do or she want to do? So if I find out that they want to buy a car, I respond appropriately. We have X number of cars in stock and I display that in my output text. And that is the end of that run. So I tell them we have three cars in stock, okay? So of course these are brief demos, but the whole point is to get the point across that I am no longer just specifying specific text in specific places, but I can have a natural spoken sentence to an application and it will respond back with a human interaction. Any questions on Lewis? 
No, 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 think so. No questions. Okay. All right. To wrap it up, uh, is it okay if we go a few minutes over, Craig? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So going back into our PowerPoint. Next is speech services. And like all the other services, it contains multiple services within it. And this one contains four, uh, being speech to text, text to speech. Uh, we can also do speech translation, or I can do speaker recognition where we can identify and verify the person speaking in an audio stream. So let's focus solely on speech to text because this can piggyback on top of Lewis in the sense of instead of me typing in a phrase, now I can speak the phrase and it will translate it to text. So this is also one of the, the simpler demos. And if we go over into Visual Studio, So this is another console application. And what I did here is I'm utilizing the SDK for the cognitive services. So I'm making reference to Microsoft.CognitiveServices.Speech and .Speech Audio. And this is because I already loaded the, uh, the library for it. And then within it, basically it's a couple simple calls. Within main, I configure the speech to utilize this key that I was able to obtain from the text-to-speech uh, portal. And so once I run through it, it's going to be fairly simple. Basically, I have an infinite loop here where it's going to listen to the microphone on my machine, and then it's going to specify the text has been recognized, and it will display what that text is, and then it will wait for me to enter in a line. So I'll go ahead and click Start. So while we're waiting for that to run, Brad has a question. What industries do you see as earliest effective adopters? Actually, there are multiples that have been adopters of this. Um, unfortunately, the, the name kind of escapes my mind, but I believe KPMG. Uh, there's also several other vendors where basically they're creating kiosks to leverage cognitive services and have a more human interaction with their user. Uh, I'd be happy to get you a list of some of those industries afterwards, but essentially, it can be used in almost every industry, really. Um, you no longer have to worry about the user typing things in. They can simply speak to their application or hold up a picture. And let me get into my app here. Obviously, one, one application, I mean, I, that I think we see it is, is IVR, right? Interactive voice response, like on phone systems, or and maybe that's a specialized example. Um, of that maybe it is but now we can carry that forward into any application and you have full control over the customization right so i i can have it so now it recognizes an oil filter within a picture it can uh respond with how many items of of that uh, oil filter that i held up in the image how many items you have in stock uh so on and so forth more importantly you look at like specialty parts for example or produce as we mentioned earlier you know, if you don't know the difference between a beet and an apple, all you got to do is hold it up and it will identify it for you, right? Yeah, I think in, in medical, like medical transcription, there used to be real people and that's disappeared, but there's still more, a lot more capabilities than just actually, you know, getting the speech to text, you know, to actually do quality controls and, you know, and so forth. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And to expand on that, like one physician that I worked with in the past, he was telling me that they actually, they, as they're transcribing, there's someone on the other end uh, overseas listening in and doing the hand entry and with the medical terms and, and the proper abbreviations. So now I can do away with that. Lewis can step in and I, instead of uh, saying that there's a, uh, a broken left arm, I can say there's, uh, what's the proper term for a broken left arm in, in the medical world? Or like a like a fractured whatever. <laughs> a fractured whatever, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. So it, it, yeah. it will transcribe that into the proper terminology. And now I no longer need that offshore person typing that in. Um, so 
multiple uses. Uh, I, I don't see it fitting into any specific industry per se, but I see it fitting in into all the industries. Um, variety of different applications. So even in uh, some requirements gathering, I, I was on a project, we had like a million requirements. If we had some you know, capabilities to do some of the scribing, would have been great. <laughs> yeah. So let me start my mic demo. And they recognize certain text. So we'll go to the next version. I would like to buy a red Mustang. Okay, so you gotta be careful with what you say because it catches everything. Do you have a blue convertible um, Buick in stock? Okay, so now it's taking the spoken text from my microphone, converting it into, I'm sorry, it's taking my spoken speech, it's converting it to text. Now what I could do essentially programmatically Take this text, pass it on to Lewis, and now I am speaking to my application and no longer typing anything in, right? Likewise, instead of displaying text on the screen saying we have 17 units in stock, I can use the capability here, text to speech, and now I can respond back to my user in speech. So now we no longer have hand entry. We no longer have a screen that we're dealing with. It's just a human interaction, right? So a lot that can be done with it, especially if you piggyback multiple services on top of each other. Uh, so really opens up a whole new realm of developing applications. So with that being a little bit over the designated time, some of the advantages that I uh, wanted to highlight, basically it's easily integrated with any type of application. Uh, so I have, Develop the console application, develop the forms application. You can also use it within web apps. Um, when we talked about the OCR, it can interpret text from a rotated image and it will provide detailed information on where the uh, text is located. And when I upload an image, it can either be something over on my hard drive that's stored, or I could be a, a URL, meaning another uh, location I just simply point to it and upload that. So I always like to do a recap, uh, and I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm just I would love to hear your feedback. What did you think of it? What are some of the things that you learned today? Some takeaways? I uh, would love to hear from you all. Well, I mean, it's definitely exciting, and you know, some of the just to you know, do some of the work without having to you know, get into a lot of coding, you know, that's great, but just really opens up a lot of innovation. So it was really an exciting presentation for me. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. I mean, in, in Azure, and um, I think, I think that's the, the, the benefit that I see in Azure, I guess, as a whole, is that it has all these little tiny, mini widgets, right? That it does each little thing does something, right? And right. as long as you know how to make the API calls and string it all together, um, you can build some meaningful stuff without not without having to write a lot of code. And and please correct me if I'm wrong there, Sam. No, you're absolutely right. And that's the whole beauty of it. Uh, you can do a whole lot with very little. Uh, and it is literally a sea of information out there on Azure. And uh, you know, cognitive services is such a a small portion within that entire ocean of services provided by Azure. Uh, but nonetheless, it's pretty powerful and very easy to access. If you'd like to learn more, uh, NIS Technologies offers courses, some of which I teach regarding uh, AI and machine learning and cognitive services specifically. I invite you to check out the website, uh, nistechnologies.com and click on the education tab. In closing, just because the presentation's over doesn't mean that the conversation stops here. I would love to hear questions from you. If you need any help developing any of these applications, uh, we can keep the conversation moving. Feel free to e email me, snasser at NIS Technologies. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, at Sam Nasser, and I blog regularly regarding AI and cognitive services, uh, samnasser.blogspot.com. And lastly, I invite you all to connect with me on LinkedIn. So with that, if there's no questions or comments, I thank you all for attending 
and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Sam, thank you so much. That was really, really good. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sam. That was uh, that was awesome. Um, yeah, it's just it's yeah, nice to know that that there was just there's a lot of I mean, there's just a lot of pieces to it. I mean, there's a lot more than just text to speech, you know. Um, yeah. And I really didn't do it a whole lot of justice because, you know, it's uh, like I said, it's a lot of information to cover within an hour. So I just touched on the, the highlights and show you how easy it is to create something. Um, but there's a whole plethora of things that can be done with it, especially, like I said, if you add two services together or piggyback them on top of each other, it uh, really opens up a whole new realm. Right. How, um, how, is, um, how is Microsoft doing, I mean, in relation to um, like the facial recognition technologies? Um, I know Google's kind of gone, gone a long way with that. Um, and some of the other companies have gone as well. How are they, where do they stand in that field? So I really haven't used other technologies. Um, I, I stick mostly to the Microsoft stack. So I really couldn't mm -hmm. comment and see how well they do. But I mean, typically uh, it's done fairly well, you know, as far as the facial recognition and uh, the, the sentiment of that image that's being uh, sent in of that face, um, as far as sad, happy, uh, emotions expressed. Um, so I haven't really had many problems with it, but Again, can't really comment on the other vendors. I, I understand. All right. Any other uh, questions from anybody? Lots of good questions and comments tonight. Sounds like we're good. All right. Well, um, Sam, thank you again for your presentation. It was awesome. Uh, and thanks, everybody, thank for attending. Uh, tonight and uh, for joining us on an odd an odd night uh, for Tech Week, but uh, it was that, that was how we did it for scheduling. Um, next month, um, it's I guess it's at this point it's kind of a mystery topic. Um, we're going to shoot for the uh, mission to Mars, but we're not 100 percent sure on that. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, check out our website. Uh, we will definitely let you uh, everyone know what it, we're, we're, we will have an event. We just don't know exactly what the topic's going to be. Yep. Thanks, Craig. We'll be on top of that. All right. Very good. Well, thank you all. And I yep. uh, hope you all have a good night. All right. Good night, good night everybody. everybody.